Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are at pedalshift.net slash 178, and you can email the show pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline at 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody on YouTube. Hello, everybody in the podcast. We are live, baby, live here in the District of Columbia. And this is the 178th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. I am Tim Mooney. Thank you all for joining. This is a uh, end of summer edition. Uh, as I sit here recording this, this is the uh, Friday of Labor Day weekend. And in the United States and in any other uh, country that has Labor Day, eh, it's kind of the unofficial end of summer. So this is the sort of let's celebrate summer. Let's celebrate the beginning of fall podcast here. Um, on this episode, we are going to be doing some things to usher in the fall. We're going to be talking a little bit about Cold brewing and cold soaking. Those were two things that I did on the most recent tour that you have heard about. And uh, they both were really, really successful. And I've talked to them about them a little bit on the show before, but I thought this would be a good opportunity in the live show environment to do a bit of a demo. So if you are listening to the podcast, I think that I'm going to be able to explain this well enough so that you sort of understand you can follow along and, and see what's going on visually, audibly non-visual medium. But if you would like to go to YouTube, go to the Pedal Shift YouTube channel and check all of this out. It's not like I'm adding a ton of visuals to all of this. I'm basically just going to be holding up things and the camera uh, <laughs> with the thrilling mic technique being shown right now uh, so that you can see levels and how much I put in and whatnot. The one thing that I'll mention about all of this is that it's very much not a science. It's a little bit more of an art. So your tastes, your desires may vary. And so we're just going to talk a little bit about that as part of all this. Second segment of the show, we're going to be doing an Ask Me Anything, and we've got a whole load of questions that are lined up and folks in the chat box as well. And uh, we got questions. We got bike touring questions, and hopefully I have answers. At least I do for the ones that I have so far. Maybe someone can throw a stumper at me. So let's kick it all off with the lab. So the lab is the section of the show where we do experimental things, and there is nothing more experimental than uh, trying out new ways to prepare food and drink while you are on tour. I did two things on this most recent tour, one that I've tried before, but I feel like I've gotten to get a little bit better at. And the other thing was brand new and sort of just occurred to me maybe within a week or so of going out on this tour, and it worked out spectacularly. So the first thing we're going to talk about is cold soaking. Cold soaking is something that has, uh, it, well, let me back up. Cold soaking is essentially a no stove option for preparing food or, in the instance of coffee, beverages. It is a great opportunity to leave the stove at home if it fits the things that you want to do, basically. Things that need to steep or rehydrate, you can do it in cold water. It just takes more time. I mean, that's the whole point. If you've got a box of mac and cheese and you're making it, you could throw that macaroni in cold water and let it sit overnight, but most of us don't have the time to sit there and wait for mac and cheese to sort of slowly rehydrate. So we boil it. Eh, sometimes things like pastas, especially heavier pastas, benefit a lot from a more rapid rehydration. Actually, just letting them sit in cold water, eh, the texture may not be as good. The flavor may not be as good. Sometimes it works for some foods and not others. And that's where the whole concept of the lab comes in. You want to experiment a lot with it. The good news is that so many people, especially backpackers, have been doing this for years and they tested this out in a variety of different ways. And that way you don't have to really reinvent the wheel too much. The one thing that I never ran into was cold brewing coffee while you're out on the trail. Now, it might be that somebody did it and put it up on YouTube or wherever and I just didn't see it. But I thought, hey, um, I'd like to give it a shot. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. I think that the reason why I wanted to go towards the cold brew for coffee and the, it's kind of a similar technique as cold soaking. You're basically putting a lot of putting cold water over the grounds, just like you would put cold water over oats or uh, ramen or things like that. Um, 
is that you can sometimes get a slightly better flavor out of certain things. Um, I think in the sense of coffee, I make it all summer long. I do it in a big mason jar. I should, I'm going to reach over here for you YouTube folks. I'll put it into a mason jar, put it in grounds, fill it up with water, and that's basically how I do it, except I do it in the refrigerator. What I wasn't sure was whether or not that would translate real well to the trail. We'll get to that in a second. What I did know that would translate really well to the trail was making oats. For those of you who were around for the show back in, oh, the spring, you'll know that I did some cold soaking on that tour as well, the big tour through Ohio, uh, basically from D.C. all the way to Cincinnati. And that I for that, I use steel cut oats. I tend to like steel cut oats at home when I'm cooking them on the stove. So I thought, oh, well, why not try that for cold soaking? Did it work? Eh, yeah, a little bit. I thought it was good, but they were really, really chewy. In fact, a little bit too chewy. So I, for this trip, decided to go with the more traditional cold soaking method, which is using rolled oats. And, you know, this is just a big old bag from Trader Joe's, kind of my grocery store of choice. What is the key here? The key is a lightweight sealable container. And so what I'm holding up for folks who are uh, not viewing this is a used washed out peanut butter jar. It's plastic, so it's super, super light. It's got a screw on top, which you can hopefully hear me screwing on, and you can screw that on really, really tight. That means that I can put whatever I want in this and water, and it's not going to leak out. One thing that I found when doing this, especially over time, if I was cycling during the day, I would have no problem putting this in my pannier. But what I ended up having was a free water bottle holster that was on the bottom of the bike, basically. It's where I tended to put emergency water. And because of the way that I was riding, I was actually carrying such a huge amount of water in my water tank bladder that I didn't have an emergency bottle. So I actually put my cold soak stuff in that holster there, which ended up working out really, really well. However, I would have no problem putting this in with, I I wouldn't put this next to my computer, maybe inside a dry bag. I'd put it into a dry bag where if it did for some reason leak, it wouldn't be that big of a disaster, perhaps with my tent. Um, But I I felt pretty comfortable that this was not going to end up leaking. So uh, that's the real key. As I mentioned, I've had really good results with oats. I know a few backpackers that I follow will use cold soaking methods for ramen too. I haven't tried that, but I've seen them do it on YouTube and it looks like it turned out pretty, pretty good. So your mileage may vary, but you want to do it with things that are a little bit on the thinner side that maybe would cook relatively quickly when exposed to boiling water. That tends to get you the best results for that. I want to throw a sidebar out there because I've got a listener, Brian Hafner, who wrote in when I first started talking about cold soaking, and I I thought he had raised a pretty good point here that I thought I would mention here. He writes, I have worked in the food manufacturing industry for the last 20 years and am very familiar with microbiologic hazards of a great number of food components. The Food Safety Modernization Act of 2011, see, he's a pro man, has done a great deal to make our food safer than ever, but it does allow microbial hazards to be managed by the end user. That using Uh, That means that you want to cook with heat. If your food package says the product requires cooking, I'd cook it. Otherwise, you're tempting fate and could end up with the squirts or worse. (laughs) That is from a food service or a food food safety professional. So, yes, I, I think that that bears repeating that certain types of foods really do want to be cooked. But I don't think you're taking too much... You're not taking too much of a risk for doing things like oats or things like that, that actually you could eat raw, perhaps, and it wouldn't be a big deal. Ramen noodles. I know lots of of, uh, backpackers will just crunch on those things. Not the greatest things in the world, but when you are hungry and you need some calories, people will do all sorts of stuff. So uh, I would throw Brian's note out there as a word of caution. Don't just think you can cold soak anything. Be mindful of what the packages are and what sort of the food safety requirements are in there as well. So like things like meats and things like that. I mean, I guess you could soak uh, uh, some beef jerky and let that rehydrate slowly. Eh, probably not your best bet. That's probably something that you'd want to do with hot water instead or boiling water, more importantly, to kill all the bugs in there. So let's talk a little bit about the um, the oats 
we'll start with the oats. And I'm going to start just really simply by showing what I do for that. So I'm going to use the mason jar here because I want to use the uh, uh, the plastic version that I have here. I only have one of these at the moment. I eat a ton of peanut butter, but I keep recycling all of the jars. I need to stop doing that. I need to at least have a couple of these for these demos and uh, for, well, you know, future tours if I'm going to do coffee in one and oats in another. Uh, I would sometimes uh, go back and forth on this tour. So I would have coffee one day and oats on another. And I ended up going with coffee much more, as you'll see in a second. It works out really, really well. So we'll use this glass jar. Can you use glass? Sure, I suppose. Um, it's heavier. It can break. I don't think it's a really great idea. So um, when it comes to the oats situation, measure out how much you think you're going to want. And one thing that I would say is consider doing this at home first. I know I did that uh, for the coffee. And just to find out, you want to test the amounts. You want to test how strong it is in the terms of the coffee. For the oats, like how much are you going to actually eat in a day or in a morning? Because the one thing is, is that you probably want to eat these pretty quickly. So for this, you know, this is about maybe a half a cup. I'm holding this up to the camera here. And, you know, that's not, that doesn't look like a lot. But remember, when that rehydrates, that's going to be a lot more. I don't like eating a ton of oats. Some people may consider filling this jar halfway up. That's fine. Your mileage may vary. A lot of folks will add things at this point. I would recommend that you go with just the oats and just anything that needs to be rehydrated at this stage. We're talking the night before or even talking 24 hours before. Um, it, it, it's not too bad to do it the morning that you're eating the breakfast from the prior day, make your breakfast for the next day. And for oats that that'll be, that's probably about the max time. Cause they really don't need that much time to rehydrate. But the, the rule that I've come to with all of this is that you want to give this enough water so that it fully covers it. And then maybe up to a knuckle more. Now I'm not going to be sticking my fingers in this to uh, show you that much, but I think you can kind of understand that it's just to basically cover it up and leave a little bit of space there. So I've got some water here and give that a little bit of a swirl. And folks who are in the uh, YouTube uh, video area or who are here in the live show, you can see it's about a knuckle's worth above it. Give it a bit of a swirl and then give that a seal. Really? That's about it. That's all you have to do. Now you just want to set it and forget it. And the beauty of this is if it gets jostled a little bit, it gets stirred up a little bit, it's not a big deal. Um, as time goes on, that actually is probably pretty good because it agitates things up a little bit and that's helpful for the process. I know a lot of folks who cold soak will throw in dried fruits and nuts and things like that. And they'll do that the night before. So they wake up and it's it's all like that. One thing that I would say is that if you're going to be doing this on tour and you're not going to have any refrigeration, you're not going to have an ice pack on you or something like that, which is frankly, most of you, I don't recommend throwing nuts or, or seeds or dried fruit or raisins or anything like that at this stage. That is much better off the next morning as an add-in. So what happens is that when you throw nuts in there, they'll soak up water too. And so you, they lose that crunchiness. The dried fruit will start to rehydrate as well. Sometimes that can be good. Sometimes that can be bad. For me, I like that real chewiness to a dried fruit. So I add it all in at the end. You could add some powdered milk to that if you'd like. If you're, if you'd like some, uh, some dairy milk, you want to make it a little bit creamier, you can do that or any other thing, maybe some spices, perhaps maybe even uh, a pinch of salt. That would all be fine at this stage, but I would recommend doing the add ons the next morning. Next morning, you wake up, you unseal this every once in a while. This will not fully, uh, re well, not all the water will be pulled into the oats. That's fine. What I found is that I would kind of open the, the jar up a little bit and then sort of maybe filter out the extra water or give it a real good shake. You know, how how much moisture you want in there is sort of up to you. You don't want it to be soupy, of course, but, you know, at the same time, you don't want it to be kind of bone dry because it's still going to be moist from pulling in all that water. But your preferences will determine how much water you want to pull out of it at the very end if there's some excess. Again, this is also another opportunity for you to make sure that your 
practicing, you know, know how much water to oats before you go. And maybe that you'll nail it every time. What I found is when I was out in the field, because it was warmer and because it wasn't being kept in a fridge or on a countertop when it's 71 degrees, but rather outside when it was 80 degrees, 90 degrees, even up to 100 degrees, things behaved differently on the trail. So remember that your mileage may vary, as I often say. So that's basically how you make your breakfast with uh, cold soaking. And frankly, you can even see already folks who are in the in the live stream, you can actually see that this is already starting to rehydrate. You get a little bit of a creamy texture when all is said and done with rolled oats. And I, uh, the one thing that I'll say is that I said up to 24 hours with rolled oats. That's really pushing it. That might be too much. This is If you're going to use rolled oats, I would say do it the night before. If you're going to be working with steel cut oats, I would give them the full 24, prep them in that morning. Um, they're still going to be very chewy. But if you really like a good chew to your oats and like steel cut oats as they are, that's something that you can do as well. So still cut uh, the rolled oats. I think they're fantastic. They turn out really, really good. I threw in some nuts. You can throw in some dried coconut, some cinnamon, anything like that. Really good way to get your morning started. I did um, I did it really simply. Uh, I didn't care for anything extra. And I didn't want to carry any cinnamon or anything like that. I basically did the rolled oats and I brought whole bananas with me. And then in the morning, I would just slice them up, throw them in and then eat that right up. And it was fantastic. Really good start to the day. And I'm not a breakfast guy, famously not a breakfast guy, perhaps. And um, this this I liked made me miss breakfast eh, for a couple of days in there after I was done touring. Because I don't tend to eat breakfast uh, when I am not touring. All right. So that is the rolled oats. Other ways that you can do it. Actually, I'm reading Brian here in the chat room. Uh, He says, strange camping meal. I used to mix dry oats and peanut butter and eat it. You know, I've done that too. And actually what I've done is I've taken a tortilla, smeared peanut butter, thrown some fresh fruit, usually berries, and thrown some of my um, oats in there. And it's fine. You know, it's like sometimes when we're on tour, we get weird. Uh, we get weird with what we eat and how we eat and how we prep. And sometimes laziness overcomes us. And sometimes you end up discovering things. You're like, oh, I kind of like it that way. This is how I ended up discovering cold brew coffee. You may be familiar with cold brew coffee. If you've gone to your, uh, your, 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 your Starbucks and your Pete's and your, your local coffee shops, hopefully, you know, there, that has been the thing for the last couple of years. And cold brew coffee is prepared a little bit differently than iced coffee, which was, has been around forever. Cold brew coffee is prepared slowly and generally in cold conditions and over a long period of time. And what you end up with is a much smoother, less acidic coffee. A lot of folks uh, will say that it's sweeter and they don't need to put sugar in it. I never put sugar in my coffee anyways, but I absolutely agree. It almost feels for a darker roast, almost chocolatey in the kind of flavor profiles that you end up getting. And I'm not one of those, you know, ooh, mm, this has got notes of berries in it. You know, I'm not that guy, but like it literally tastes a little chocolatey to me, which I think is fantastic. So that's what I do. Oh, but the one thing about it, when you get it at a coffee shop, it's stupid expensive. Sometimes it's like five, six bucks for just, you know, like a regular sized one. Um, it's often very, um, uh, concentrated and people will water it down after they prep it. I got to the point where I was like, I liked the really, really dark, rich version of it and I don't water it down at all. If I bought that, it would bankrupt me really, really quickly. So I have gotten to the point where I've been making it uh, in my refrigerator every morning. Once it gets warm out, um, I start having that instead of hot coffee in the morning. And then what I'll do is I will filter it. I'm holding up for the chat room folks and the live folks through this stainless steel strainer. And then it drips right out and I put it over ice and it's great. Well, that's awesome. And I was sitting there a few weeks before this past tour. And I was bemoaning the fact that I was going to be in a uh, hot, it's going to be warm, almost maybe even hot in the mornings. And I was like, oh, I just don't want to have hot coffee. And so for a lot of my tours, you've heard I've taken caffeine pills and I've skipped coffee. And frankly, that's just not as enjoyable to me. And I thought, 
well, why can't I try to make cold brew coffee on the trail? Now, granted, I'm not going to have ice with me and I'm not going to be able to have like an ice cold coffee like I'm accustomed to. But you know what? Maybe I can get that flavor profile and maybe because it'll still be relatively cool because it's sat overnight, eh, maybe it'll, it'll be a good way to start my mornings. So I thought I would give it a shot. So here's how we went about doing it. Holding up uh, for the folks who are just listening, the peanut butter jar. This is a smaller jar than what I typically use for my cold brew. I tend to make more cold brew at home than I need to drink in an entire day. So sometimes a batch will last me a couple of days. My idea was I wanted to make sure that I was going to make a batch for one day of a tour. And I thought, eh, one peanut butter jar will probably give me at least one and maybe just a little bit more than one full, full cup in my kind of traveling mug. And I thought, eh, that's probably way more coffee than I would need, but that's probably what I would want. I would want that option to have a big, full coffee in the morning. So that's what I stuck with in terms of the amount. The next question was going to be, do I go with pre-ground coffee or do I do what I normally do? And that is to ground my beans. Well, if you know me at all, Bam. I ground my beans. I brought I brought the grinder with me. So I, every morning for the next day or the night before, actually, I did this on the trail the night before when I was, uh, you've heard the first part of the uh, tour. I actually did this under a bridge where there was a light and I ground with my hand grinder. This is the Hario, Hario, I think, Gr- hand grinder. You want to do this with a really coarse grind, as coarse as you can get. What's interesting is my fancy schmancy coffee grinder that I have here at home that is considered quite nice, actually, I think makes a worse heavy grind. It's good with with smaller grinds, but when you make a cold brew, you want the coarsest, like beyond even French press. This is thrilling, thrilling radio, I'm sure. But in any event, folks who are in the in the live stream, you can see that's about how much coffee that I would grind to put in the peanut butter jar. And so, peanut butter jar. Now, so for the benefit of folks at home, at where where the line where let me make sure there we go the line where uh, the jar starts to kind of go straight up. I fill all the way to that. So it's probably about an inch worth of ground coffee. That's a fair amount of coffee. That's a a lot of coffee. But what that does is it gets you exactly where you need to be. So again, taking my water, you fill that up. Not quite to the top. And this was, again, through some experimentation, some give and take. Seal that up. And then give that a little bit of a swirl. It's really that easy. And so I took this <laughs> dank looking peanut butter jar and I put it in the bottom. It's below, right by the bottom bracket where I have a kind of my emergency water bottle holder. So it got exposed directly to the trail, but it was fine. It was no big deal. Yeah, I got some trail dirt on it, some trail mud on it. It was dusty, but you know, I would just wipe that off or rinse it off with some water later. It's perfectly fine. Nothing was getting in there. And yeah, it would get a little agitated through the day and it would brew slowly. Now, granted, it was getting exposed to warmer temperatures than I normally put it through. And that was my one big question was, would is cold brew really meant to be cold? And if it is not going to be, uh, if if I'm exposing it to higher than refrigerator temperatures, was I creating issues? And the answer to that, well, I won't spoil it. It has to. I have to prepare it first. So what would I do? I showed you the filter before. Actually, I'll show it once again. The one that I use, it is a little bulky. It's not terribly heavy, but it's stainless steel. It's got some girth to it, some bulk to it. And I didn't want to expose it to getting smushed or any issues with all of that. So what I decided to do instead was get a different type of filter. And I'm going to show this to the folks. It's this very foldable, very lightweight filter with three basically plastic sporks on it. And those fit right on the top of my pedal shift branded. Well, just because I threw a sticker on it, 
mug that I seal up. And it's double walled and all that, so it'll it'll hold cold or hold hot, depending on what it got. I typically don't bring this with me camping, but for this, it was perfect. So what do I do after that? I take, after a, a sufficient amount of time, I take this, I dump it right into here, and you'd be surprised how fast it drains through. Because those um, the coffee grinds are very coarsely ground, it just goes right through, and it creates this beautiful, clean cup of coffee. And it was fantastic. It was as good as what I make here. The only downside to it, of course, was that I didn't have ice to put it over. And I I would have loved to have had a nice cold, ice cold drink in the morning to get me started that was, you know, good and caffeinated and had that nice little punch to it. But this was fantastic because, you know what, it was still kind of cool because um, it's it was sitting there through the coldest part of the night, which granted was only about 70 degrees, but 70 degrees is better than 90 degrees. And so as a result, I ended up with a re- really great way to start off my morning and it went fantastic. I'm here to tell you, I think that I may be doing this for my coffee prep kind of permanently. Um, I, for years, I, you know, when I would bring a stove, I would often use the, um, the, the, the Starbucks, uh, uh, instant coffee. And I got to the point where I just didn't like the flavor of that anymore. It tastes like instant coffee to me now, just a different type. So nowadays, I think what I'm going to be doing is I'll bring the grinder. If I'm going to be traveling heavy, I'll bring, maybe I'll just bring ground coffee. If I don't want to be uh, going as heavy, it won't be as good. I'm sure. But if I can grind fresh beans and then bring this little contraption that I'm showing here, basically this really, really, um, not flimsy, rather well built, but very, very lightweight filter that takes care of everything. Super easy to clean. I just knocked it into uh, my little garbage bag that I carry with me all the time. Was able to get the grounds, was able to dispose of them properly. Um, don't just throw those out. That's kind of, that doesn't follow leave no trace principles live show. So you got the dog. There we go. He wanted to go on the other side. I think what he wants to do is I think he wants to attack the other dog. But, you know, anyways, live show. Hi. <laughs> so um, that was basically how my cold brew experiment went. It worked really well. I will definitely do it again. I would even consider doing it for saving some time in the mornings. Uh, because what you could do is you could do the cold brew and you could actually just heat that up. If you did bring a stove and it was a colder night, uh, and a colder morning and you wanted something hot, you could easily just give that a little bit of a reheat or even just add hot water to it, like boiling water to that. And then that would do really well. Now, of course, if you're below freezing, all bets are off. You want to kind of boil water and do this all, um, <laughs> the, the traditional way anyways. But if it's, uh, you know, a fall kind of a trip or a spring, early spring kind of a trip, that might be another option for you as well, especially if you prefer the flavor of cold brew. And I'm starting to get to the point where that's kind of where I'm at. So anyways, I thought that would be helpful to show rather than just tell. So again, if you were listening to this only, go to the YouTube channel. You can at least see some of the work that I did here to demonstrate it. And you can also hear the dog going crazy as we close out the segment of the lab on cold soaking and cold brew. All right, next up on the show is the Ask Me Anything segment, and this is all about bicycle touring and things related to this show. So we're going to get cracking right here. The first question that we have is from Vince LaGreco, and he asks, have you ever considered using Patreon for the Pedal Shift Society? Vince, I actually have, I, when I first came up with the Pedal Shift Society, which is not a new idea by any stretch of the imagination, just the name, um, I consider doing Patreon, but Patreon, the one thing that I don't care for it as much, and no disrespect to the Patreon folks, they need to make a dime on this as well, is that they take a a deeper cut than how I set things up. They basically route it through the same stuff. They route it through PayPal or through Stripe like I do, except they take a little bit of a cut. So I thought I would cut out the middle person and end up uh, making it all work out better. So uh, that's why I don't use Patreon. I would consider using Patreon if there was a compelling reason to, but as of the moment, I don't think there is, but convince me otherwise, shoot me an email. If, if, if you think I should use Patreon instead, please let me know. I would be curious because, um, I am handy with the coding and that's why, uh, I was able to roll my own with what I did there. Although, except it didn't work for a little while and there's, as a long time Pedal Shift Society folks might remember. 
Brian Bechtal in the chat box asks, any prior BMX or mountain biking experience? Excellent question. So uh, hit the way back clock to the mid 1980s. Yes, I am that old. Um, I was uh, coming back from a stint overseas with my family and it was the height of BMX time in Western New York in the mid 1980s. It was, it was like the later 1980s, like 80s, let's say 86, 87. And that was the bike that I sort of coveted, but I ended up only having like one of those kind of classic 10 speed bikes. And I never really got into the BMX experience, although I, I was super interested in it and that sort of passed me by and i was a 10 speed kid for basically my teenage years um but that did it the experience of that and and you know watching uh watching my friends on the dirt trails and beneath the power lines yeah we were weird uh <laughs> there were dirt trails in the cutouts by where the power lines went through the neighborhoods and stuff i don't know i don't know why we we thought we were badasses for uh biking there um and anyways, so that got me interested in what eventually became my mountain biking phase. When I was in Oregon in the dream of the 90s, as I call it, I had a suspension and I had a non-suspension mountain bike. And I really, really enjoyed mountain biking. I did not go on very technical trails. I did do some single track, but not anything really, really demanding. Um, so I would never put my experience up against somebody who's like a real mountain biker by any stretch the imagination. But that's the kind of biking that I did while I was out west during that time period, um, which is really interesting because the whole thing about bicycle touring, I, you know, the elements were all there when I was younger, but it never really came about until about 10 years ago or so. And then, well, as you have all experienced, I've sort of just barfed it all out on the internet for you here. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed mountain biking, but I haven't done it in a while. Um, I haven't been on a, mo a modern mountain bike and it's something that I think I want to do at some point. But, you know, when you have a limited amount of time for your bikey adventures, you're, I'm sort of like, Ugh, I really like this one thing. If I do something else, it's going to take away from that because that's time I could be spent doing bike touring. So what I think I'm going to be doing is doing a trip like what Mysterious James is doing right now. He's doing the divide, the, the continental divide ride and doing stuff a little bit more backcountry on a little bit more kind of gravel grindery kind of stuff. The the stuff that um, folks at Pathless Pedal are doing. I mean, that 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 stuff look, looks really intriguing. I just would have to invest in a different type of bike or borrow a bike or rent a bike to do that kind of stuff. But yeah, my mountain biking background kind of gets me interested in that element of bike packing. Um, I just haven't done a ton of it. So anyways, a lengthier answer to your question there. Uh, Greg Middlemas, one of the Michigan guys, he asks, where was it? I had it here. I know it was about the 44. Oh, what is the significance of 44? You've put pedal shift stickers on mile marker 44 signs on some tours. Aha. So this goes to the why orange question as well. So I went to Syracuse University for undergrad and I, I, it's not like I had a great college experience. I just sort of enjoyed, I sort of, I enjoyed it. And I really, I grew up nearby Syracuse. And so I'm into the whole Syracuse football, Syracuse basketball thing. Okay. So if you're into Syracuse athletics, number 44 is a very, very important number. It was, uh, the, the number that was passed out to the big time running backs of Syracuse University football lore. So Jim Brown had it. Uh, um, uh, Ernie Davis had it. All sorts of really, these are names that if you're into the sports ball, you're like, Oh, Oh, I know that guy. Um, if you're not, you're like, Ernie who? Is that the guy with Bert? No. Uh, anyway, so 44 is a really important number in Syracuse football legends. It's given also to basketball players of note. The, the it, Strangely enough, the lacrosse players don't get 44. I think they get 22. I don't know why they did it that way because it's half of 44. I don't know. Anyways, 44 is a big deal. So, you know, people often pick round numbers to do things on for bike tours or whatever. And I thought, eh, I want to be a little bit different. So, that's why I, whenever I do a little Easter egg, I'll do it at mile marker 44s. And I try to do it in a way that's not like dickish or anything like that. I don't slap it on the front of the sign. The only time I've, I've slapped a sticker on the front of the sign, which kind of goes against, I think I got kind of pilloried a little bit on uh, Twitter recently about uh, slapping a sticker on uh, the, the uh, tunnel outside of Arch Cape Tunnel. He was like, oh yeah, Mr. Leave No Trace, I think was the idea there, which kind of funny and kind of touche. But eh, I think there's a difference between camping Leave No Trace and slapping a sticker when there's a hundred other stickers on that sign. Anyways, I put that in the wheel of the bicycle because it just made a lot of sense. 
Anyways, so that's um that's the whole idea about why 44, why orange. It's because I really like Syracuse. I I it's it's my it's my it's my thing. Live show folks, you can hear, of course, the cat is going crazy. One of my dogs is going crazy because he hates the cat. This is how it works in my household. You've got the cat gets on Mookie's nerves, so Mookie barks. When Mookie barks, that sets off Gizmo. When Gizmo gets set off, Bellstar will just jump in and bite whoever's there. It's pretty funny. Um, anyways, that's 44. Thanks, Greg, for that question there. Uh, next one from email. I'm not a camper, but willing to try. I worry about getting a comfortable night's rest. What are some things I should get to give me the best chance at a full night's sleep? I think that's a great question. Let me throw a few things that have helped me out in terms of getting a good night's sleep. I think the first thing is to understand that camping, I never get a great night's sleep. Sometimes I do, but it's unusual that I get a great night's sleep. But I can do things to help make it be better than tossing and turning all night. The first thing that I would say is you want to make sure that you're comfortable from a temperature perspective. So make sure that you're bringing the right sleeping bag. Um, Sometimes that may be a really, really light sleeping bag when it's the teeth of summer. Sometimes that may be a zero degree bag, a mummy bag and a hat and all that other stuff. So just be prepared for the temperatures that you've got. The second thing I would say is get a good sleeping pad. Used to be back in the day, I would use those Thermarest uh, self-inflatable ones, but they're really bulky and frankly, I found that over time they would get leaks and stuff like that. And that just never really worked out really well for me from a bike, a bike camping perspective. So I started getting into the true inflatables and those have worked out really, really well. I've been really happy with REI. I know Big Agnes makes a good one. Um, find the one that you like and go with it. They're fantastic. They are like sleeping on an air mattress, and that can make a big difference for comfort. A lot of folks like the closed cell foam. If if you can sleep on that, awesome, go for it. Um, they're easier. You don't have to worry about getting leaks. But I like having that little air mattressy thing. It works out best for me. And also when it's cold out, it really is insulating to have that layer of air, that big pocket of air between you and the ground. Very, very important. Last but not least, I would say um, a gentle listener who wrote this in, I would say earplugs. Earplugs, I don't love all the time, but they can be very handy out on trail. Sometimes, you know, you're out there and you hear the crack of a, a, a deer walking by or something like that, and you're a little bit more on alert because you're in a tent. Or sometimes there's cicadas going off until three in the morning and it's just super loud. Or you've got trains nearby. You know what? Earplugs, they're not perfect, but they do a really, really nice th- job of it. So I would say those three things would be really helpful to give you a good chance at a full night's sleep. Um, a pillow uh, would be one other thing that I would throw in there. I bring an inflatable pillow along, and that helps a lot. Some folks just throw uh, stuff in a stuff sack, like clothes and things like that, and that's good enough for them. The inflatable pillow has been much better for me. So uh, let's see. Question from the chat room. Rod Schultz from State College, PA. See, we used to be big, big, uh, big rivals with uh, Penn State back when I was at Syracuse. And then Penn State just wiped the floor with us all the time. So my freshman year was just a disaster. Anyways, uh, Rod asks, when I tour the Gapco next spring and summer, spring or summer, should I look at May or June or does it matter? Great question. I would say. Go with the time that makes the most sense for you. I don't think there's usually much difference between May or June, although I will say if you don't like cool weather, then you are far more likely to get warm weather in June than you will in May. You might also get hot weather in June. You sometimes can get hot weather in May, especially down here as you get more towards uh, D.C. But I would say this year when I did my spring tour, I was expecting it to be warm and it actually was chilly to cold for the entire length of my trip. Now, I went all the way into Ohio, which was colder than Pennsylvania it was for the the gap. You won't be doing that, but you're going to be at elevation for a little bit. So I would say if you care about the temperature a little bit and you want a little bit of a warmer ride, then I would say go June. From a rain perspective, some would say that June is less wet than May. 
I think it's a crapshoot. I think that um, it's about the same. Um, take a look at sort of when you're looking, because it may make a difference if it's, say, early May versus late May or early June or late June or whatever you're kind of focusing on. Take a look at the historic rainfall. Um, you can Google that, and there's a bunch of different weather sites that'll have that, and that can be helpful uh, for maybe trying to figure out a time that might be drier versus wetter. Um, dry is always better. I would say probably June for that, but that's it's it's always a bit of a crapshoot, and it always depends on how hot it's getting to, because then you can start getting into thunderstorm season. You can start getting thunderstorms down here as early as June for sure. Um, but I would say it's a great time to come. Uh, I recently was asked the question, spring or fall for the, the Gap or, and the CNO or both. And I would lean a little bit more towards fall. Temperatures are a little bit cooler. You get the foliage. You've got all of that going on. Uh, it's a little bit drier often. Um, but I, you know, I'm a fall guy too. I, I love the fall. So that would be it. Uh, Aaron in the chat room asks in this ask me anything section, have you ever thought about doing rag bribe? Uh, rag bribe, if you're not, not familiar with it is, is enormous city on bicycle wheels across the great state of Ohio. It is run by, I believe, one of the uh, the one of, if not the big paper in the state of Ohio. And uh, RAGBRAI stands for Ride Across Something. Anyways, it's an acronym. <laughs> but have I thought about it? Yes. Ha- have I been tempted to do it? Yes. The one thing that I will say is that it is it's bicycle touring for me is often an escape from people. And this is very much the opposite of that. It is a gigantic production. It's really cool. Everybody that I've ever talked to who's done it says it was great and life changing and it's really well set up and it's a big party and it's a very bikey and very cool. And you get to see oh, Iowa and you get to go, go across Iowa in a cool way. I, 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 I think Iowa is a beautiful state. I've driven uh, across it a few times. I would love to do it by bicycle. But uh, for some reason, it has never worked for my schedule. And also, I'm, I'm, reluctant to sign up for something like that because of the bigness of it. It might be too big for me, but I may change my mind. I don't know. I'll take a look at it next year because um, it is one of those things. It's sort of like, you know, riding the Katy Trail. You got to do it. You know, if you're into bicycle touring, you got to ride the Katy Trail. You got to ride the CNO. You got you to ride the Pacific Coast. You got to do some of these things because it, you'd be missing out on an experience. And I don't want to miss out on an experience because it's not fully in my comfort zone. Um, I think Pushing yourself through some comfort zones eh, can be really rewarding at times. So I'm going to have to think about a little bit more about that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, the Iowa registers great bike ride across Iowa. So registers great bike ride across Iowa. It, it is fantastic and it is really, really, really good. So did I say Ohio earlier, Aaron? <laughs> if I did, I meant I, I definitely meant Iowa. I think I have Ohio on my brain here. Uh, Todd. Todd Grossbeck, any word on a new campground in Ohio, Hell, I was just thinking about this today. Um, I saw in one of the variety of chat boxes, chat rooms, bulletin boards, Facebook, something like that. I saw somebody asking about camping in Ohio pile and they're like, oh, I'm really excited to go to the campground in Ohio pile. And then like a bunch of people chimed in and said, don't forget, it's about a thousand foot walk up a really steep trail. And I keep thinking, I keep hearing this, this, uh, this. Uh, trail level campground is coming, but it has not come. It's not here yet. Um, if anybody knows anything about it, please let me know. Um, I, it, it's allegedly right around the corner. I've, I've, uh, mentioned I talked to, um, one of the folks over at, uh, who works with the Great Allegheny Passage stuff. He's been on the show, Doug. Uh, and he's like, yeah, it's coming. I think it's just one of those things that whatever it is with the state park, there's some last final I that needs to be dotted or T that needs to be crossed. I've never seen any reference to it specifically on the, it through the state parks. Um, but I trust Doug and I trust that he knows what's going on with that. I think it's coming. I just don't know when I would love it if it were here before fall, but you know, I think this is the second season in a row where it was like, oh, it's coming and it hasn't come yet. So mm, I'm really hopeful to see it because it is at a great spot on the trail. It would be a perfect two day trail if Ohio pile had a great campground option and it just doesn't at this point. You've got some other options relatively nearby, but it doesn't, it doesn't split that trail into two quite right. 
I don't really want to do it, the, the gap in two days unless I really needed to make miles. It's a very long 75 miles each day. So, but I would love to stay there. Ohio House is just beautiful. And I think it would be a fantastic place to have a campground that's a hiker biker type of thing. I think it would get used. Um, I think it would be fantastic. So I would love to see that. I hope it's coming. And unfortunately, I don't have any news for you on that. Uh, next up, how do you keep food from going bad from one of the listeners here on the AMA? Uh, how do I keep food from going bad? I think that the answer for that is I eat it before it goes bad. And then the second thing is I tend not to get things that will go bad. The one thing I will say is on this last trip, I experimented with carrying a big, big, big ice block, essentially. It was one of those frozen packs from one of our meal delivery uh, boxes because it stayed frozen for a full 24 hours outside of the freezer. And it was great. I was able to put a, a, a sandwich in there and cold drinks and stuff like that. And I've experimented with that with overnights as well. So you can do stuff like that. You can bring a cooler, drag a trailer with you and bring a cooler. You can do something like that. Um, you know, you don't have to, um, go this sort of super minimalist type of thing. You can definitely grab uh, a cooler with you if you'd like to as well. So that's that. Uh, I'm just getting started trying to decide between bike packing or bike touring setups. It seems like I can tour with bike packing gear, but not the other way around. What do you think? What do I think? Um, I think that you should go with the one that you're more interested in. I think that, yes, you're kind of right. You could tour with bike packing gear, um, but often you're right. That's because you've got a bike doesn't maybe that maybe is better suited for backcountry riding rather than doing some road riding or more like super smooth trail riding so you know uh right tool for the right job i mean a lot of bikes can do both you're right but i would say what are the tours what are the the, what are the trails that you want to do the most and get the get get the stuff if you're buying new stuff get it for that and worry about the rest later you're not going to miss out uh, I've been missing out because I don't have a bike packing bike per se. I suppose I could use one of my bikes. The, 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 my regular touring bike could probably be outfitted in a way that could do some bike packing, but it's a heavy steel frame bike and, you know, it's not built for that. Um, if I want to do bike packing, um, maybe I'll borrow a bike or do something a little bit different down the line. But, um, I would say go with the adventure that is most pulling you in. If that is bike packing, you should do that. Uh, if it is bike touring, you should do that. Um, but don't stress too much about the distinctions between the two because it's all sort of mashing together a lot. I'm using a lot of bike packing techniques with what I'm doing on bike tours now. So I would say go with the adventure that you want and worry about the gear that best suits that. Uh, let's see. I've got two more here, including one that I definitely want to get to. Uh, let's do the, the fun one first. Best pop tart flavor. Go. Okay. Um, I get two. My favorites are strawberry and brown sugar. And the thing is, I can't choose just one because I am very much mood driven with the pop tart. There are times when I definitely would be like, oh, I have a brown sugar, but I really want a strawberry. Oh, I have a strawberry, but I really want a brown sugar. It's usually I have the one that I don't want as much as the other one. It's really bad. Sometimes I buy both. I'll buy a box of each that I've got both. I don't know why, but it's just one of those things. Those are my two favorites. I've had others. They don't wow me as much. Pop-Tarts are only things that I eat on tour. That They are great for, as I've rediscovered, for a big burst of energy. They are stupid, stupidly caloric. They're stupidly sugary, um, but they are great for giving you that little bit of a punch. They stand up to a lot of, of, of damage. Yeah, they'll get all crumbly in the thing, but then you just like kind of shake them down your mouth and they're great. Uh, strawberry, brown sugar. That's what That's what I'm going with. Last question of the night. Byron from Australia. Uh, let's see. Did I, I, I did not intend for that to sound like an Australian accent. That was me just kind of like marble mouthing Australia. Okay. Number one. <laughs> Have you thought about going tubeless? It's the tubeless people, man. They're coming after me. Uh, especially if you continue down the lighter weight bike packing style and go off road. I recently did it to my touring bike for a dirt social event. I was both trickier. It was both trickier and easier than I thought. Okay. Tubeless. I, I am at this point not ready to join the tubeless cult. Although I am super excited about tubeless people being into tubeless because yes, I see all of the cool benefits of it. Um, for me in the here and now, it's sort of like that thing that tubes are working just fine for me. 
I have I, I ride on Schwalbe marathons. They tend I tend to never get punctures in them at all, ever. Uh, it's very rare that I get flats with them. So except when the tires fail, but that's a longer story, and it's usually the sidewalls. And anyways, Schwalbe marathon pluses, I don't get flats in them, and they are indestructible. And so I haven't felt the pull of tubeless so much. I don't none of the advantages to tubeless apply to me because it basically all works out for me and it's fine. I I mean I may I may try and try it just because again, um there's no reason for me not to. It's just it's a lot it's a bit of a hassle if you know I gotta do all of gotta get the tires and the I gotta have the special wheels and all that. Anyways, uh for now no, but I am tubeless curious if only because I know so many people are into it and I want to be able to talk about it a little bit more author not authoritatively, but like with experience rather than just my, oh, I don't know, guys. All right. Number two, Byron asks, have you played around with anything, anything new trail cooking wise? I've dehydrated my own vegetables from a frozen packet and I'm looking to see if a you could use beef jerky in a meal too. We kind of covered that a little bit tonight. I would say cold soaking has uh, been the thing that I've been trying the most. I, I do still dehydrate. Um, kale chips are awesome. They're a great snack and you can get some great greens, like good, deep, dark, leafy greens like your doctor tells you to eat. Um, those are really, really good. Uh, beef jerky in a meal, dude, go for it. If you're, if you're eating meat, it's a good way to do it. I have gone more towards veg in recent years or so. Um, but there's all sorts of great, um, uh, uh, veg jerkies out there as well that I want to experiment with and maybe even see if I can figure out if I can use my dehydrator for something like that. Um, I don't have anything against, uh, making the, the beef jerky or any other kind of jerky. I may even make some, uh, uh, for myself for down the road because I'm not fully vegetarian, but, um, may try that out. Uh, but I, I think that I used to bring when I made, uh, boy, this is early pedal shift. This might be even before the pod. I used to not have a dehydrator and I made beef jerky in my toaster oven. I have a whole a Google or, or search in the little search box in the upper right of uh, pedalshift.net and just put a dehydrator or jerky or something like that. And you can find how to make it in a toaster oven. Um, it was it was a weird time, man. I was experimenting with all sorts of stuff. The lab was truly the lab back then. All right, folks, with my dog hacking in the background, I think that that is it for the AMA section. That is also it for the show. Thank you for joining. And uh, for folks on the podcast, I've got one more section left for you, and you know what it is. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows, meetups, tour journals, you name it. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot in annual options. If you're not into the whole small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgadis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buchan, Mr. T, Roxy Arning, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Paul Culbertson, Scott Culbertson, Cody Forchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Aviles Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gephardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Letoile Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafter, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messinger, and David Grotke. And thanks also to all past and anonymous donors for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album, 
track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.